Y'all hear me? Yeah. Well, good morning. I'm going to clean some of the junk off here. This is like our pulpit. Like no, we don't have a big one like this anymore. Got to get a clear one or something. You can't collect any junk up here. Well, it's a blessing to be here this morning. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, you're going to find out real shortly I'm kind of a noisy guy and I move around a lot. So I hope that don't bug you too much. Got my beautiful wife, Debbie, of 34 years here with me. My friend, Alex, and his, his beautiful wife, Elisa. So you know in Canada, you ever go fishing in Canada, they say A after everything? They go, hey, you, you want to go fishing, eh? Like that? You ever hear that? Two things I found out in the kingdom of God. It's okay to have some fun in church and you can be a little noisy, okay? Make a little noise for me. Hey, if you ever talk to Alex, his thing is yo. How you doing, yo? What's up, yo? Where you going, yo? So he's got his own uh, dialect of the English language. So this morning, I want to do two things. I want to lift up the name of Jesus. And when I'm done today, I want you to be encouraged. Okay? Because you and I have enough stuff in this life to bring us down and to discourage us. Would you agree? Yeah. You know, we have sickness on our bodies. We have financial stuff. Our whole government's going crazy right now, if you're not familiar with that. I'm not very political because I believe in God. And I read the last page of the Bible, and we win at the end. So it really doesn't matter what the political temperature is. I really don't care. I'm going to vote. I'm going to I'm going to exercise my constitutional right, right, Bobby? Maybe yes. carry a gun if I want, but... With my permit, of course. Yes. <laughs> so we have some rights. Amen? Amen. So I, I not only want to lift up the name of Jesus and encourage you, I'm going to share a little testimony with you, and I'm going to share some scripture with you, and then we all can go home and eat. Does that sound good? Doesn't matter if it sounds good or not. I got the mic. <laughs> you can't do nothing about it. I'll do what I want when I'm up here, right? And if you don't like what I do, see Chris, because he invited me. Okay? <laughs> so hopefully I can get you to laugh a little bit, but... So, you know, I grew up in a denominational church, and the denominational church that I grew up in, they didn't talk about receiving Jesus. They didn't talk about your name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I didn't know nothing about that. I didn't find anything out about that until I was 20 years old. So I'm 58 now, and I'm still blown away. I was blown away last week. I, I text, uh, you guys all know Greg Martz. He gave me one of them ugly ugly sweater Christmas things. Well, I was walking around the house in my underwear with the ugly sweater on and I was thinking about all the blessings in my life. I don't know if you've ever been praying or just thinking of tears, but I could have. But I just felt overwhelmed with the blessing of God in my life. You know, even standing there in my underwear with the stupid ugly sweater on. It didn't, it didn't matter much. But they didn't talk anything about that. And I grew up, I grew up in a good home. I had, my parents were married for over 50 years. They separated when my dad died, and they were faithful people to church. They were blue-collar workers that went to work. We always had food on the table. There were seven kids in the family. I'm number six of seven. There was five girls. I got five sisters and one brother, who my brother was a hippie from the 60s. Now, I was born in 61, so the whole hippie movement was just happening. But by the time I became a te teenager, that movement was attractive to me. I liked motorcycles. I liked tattoos. I like that, what they stood for, all that freedom stuff and all that. But I missed the movement. By the time I started acting like a hippie, the movement was over. The only thing that remained from the movement was all the drug aspect of it, which I got involved with that. And it wasn't because my parents were lousy parents. My parents were great parents. It was because I got tied up with the wrong people. And when you get tied up with the wrong people, that, leaves a bad, that can leave a bad influence on your life. So I was trying to chase after my brother's friends and my brother's way of life, who, by the way, my brother's a prison chaplain now, and he's a pastor of a church, and he's been a devout Christian for 40 years now. So he put all that behind him. You know, thank God for the blood of Jesus, right? Amen. So I, I didn't know nothing about that. So it was my, I lived in, I lived in uh, northern Jersey. I was working for my brother-in-law who had a business down in the city. Not New York City, but in the city of the suburb of Jersey. I was working for him. And my brothers, some of my brother's friends had called me and said, listen, we're not sure what's going on with your brother, but he got this Jesus thing. He's always talking about Jesus. I said, I know, he's my brother. He's been talking to me about Jesus. So he wants to come to my house. I'm living with my girlfriend at the time. He wants to come to my house and spend the whole weekend with us. 
He called me like five times. I'm like, I said to my girlfriend, we're going to have to have him because he's not going to be denied. So he comes to my house. He comes on a Saturday, like early, 11 o'clock. So we're there all 11 o'clock from Saturday into Sunday all day, right? So that night, Saturday night, he started, as soon as he got out of the car, it didn't take him five minutes, he started with all this Jesus talk. You know, listen, you need to receive Jesus. You've got to have Jesus. You know, I don't want to see you wind up, you know, I want to see you in heaven when I get there. He never did say you're going to go to hell, which was a good thing. But, uh, so he started talking all this Jesus talk. And my buddies told me, he said, listen, we know your brother good. We know your brother better than you, than you know him. He's a phaser. This is going to be a phase. He's going to go through this phase, and then he's just going to go back to the way he was. He did this before. So how, how Debbie and I wound up coming up here is my brother came up here in 72, well, right before the flood. That was in 72, right? They came up to 71 because all the cops were looking for him and his buddies because they were all drug users, and when you use drugs, you wind up selling drugs to pay for the drugs because when you're trying to use drugs, you trying to sell some, but then you use what you're supposed to sell, so then you're in debt, and it's just a big vicious circle. So they all, they bought this farm out in, uh, what's the name of the bridge? Falls. Uh, you know where Falls is? It's right below Tonkanic. They bought a farm out there, and all them hippies moved from Jersey up to the farm. They were going to start a commune. Well, you know how long that lasts. People all living together in the same space, that don't last too long. I think it lasted, maybe, if it lasted a year, it lasted a long time. But that's how my brother got up here, and that's how we came up here later on, much later on, Debbie and I came up. Uh, to Pen that's how we wound up in Pennsylvania, because he followed the hippie community. My brother still lives right by where the farm was. Everybody else is gone, but he's still there. So, um, you know, my, my parents would take us to church, and I really wasn't getting nothing out of church. It was kind of, not that it was legalistic, but it was kind of boring. That's why I like to have a little fun in church. I, I got the feeling this morning, you guys are a really family-oriented church, and I like that. Somebody could say something if they want to or whatever. See, just because I'm standing up here, it doesn't mean God likes me or loves me anymore than he likes or loves you. Matter of fact, the more time I spend in the kingdom of God, and the more things I think I know, the more things I realize I don't know nothing. So I'm just one beggar this morning trying to tell a couple other beggars where to find the bread at. So, you know, I just... So anyway, my brother says, listen, here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow morning, you and your girlfriend are going to go to church with us. I said, oh my God, we're going to go to church. Okay, we'll go to church. So there was this church in a town that we grew up in. It was an independent church. And my brother heard about it. He had, he'd never even been there himself, but we got invited. So we went there. Now, when you're running around looking in your rearview mirror, more time than you're looking out your windshield, you're always watching your back when you're doing stuff that's a little shady. So we, we got down there to the church. We went, we, we agreed to go. We went with him. And we got down there and, you know, we came through the front door and they had greeters, which the church I grew up in didn't have any greeters. And everybody was real happy. You know, everybody, oh, nice to see you. Thanks for coming today. You know, shaking your hand. Some people were hugging me. I'm like, hmm, it's, it's a little weird. But, you know, I, I was okay with weird stuff because when you're in that realm, a lot of things are weird. But, uh, so we get inside and they give the announcements and, they had a, a full band, and people were standing to their feet. A lot of people had their hands up, and they were singing. People were singing, like, with all their might, with all their strength, and I never saw that. So when you're in that realm of selling drugs and all that, you try to blend in if you can. So if you're going down a highway and everybody's going 55, you kind of stay with the traffic. Or if they're going 80, you stay with the traffic. So when I got there and everybody had their hands up, I looked at my girlfriend, and the heck, let's just blend in, right? So we kind of blend in. When the pastor came out, he was, his message was he was talking about having a, a clean, clear relationship between you and God. And I never heard that kind of preaching before. You know, the church I went to, they did a reading of the scriptures. That's about all the, that's about all the gospel you got was a reading of the scripture. And it sounded like to me that this pastor, like him and Jesus, were out the night before and they had a couple of beers and a pizza together. That's what it sounded like to me. Like, he had a relationship with the Lord that I knew nothing about. Excuse me. So we, he gets to the end. I was attracted to it. I liked it. I'm like, this, this, is, this had, it had a real feeling to it. It was real. And I wasn't used to that in church. Like, church was kind of, it's almost like something you just did. It was like, it was like going to a, to a ball game or something or going out to eat. You just went there, you paid your dues, and you left. You know, you didn't, it had nothing beyond that for me. And when he started talking about this clear relationship with you and God, so at the end he said, 
every, every head bowed and every eye closed. He said, if you're sitting in this room this morning and you never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, he said, oh, you can do that right now by raising your hand. And that was the first time I was, I think I was, I was almost 20. I was right on the verge of being 20. I was 19 years old. And I heard that voice of God as clear as a bell, and I never heard it before, before that day. And the Spirit of God said to me, that's you. He said, if you were to die today, you wouldn't be in heaven with me. Actually, the pastor said that. He said, if you were to die today on your way home from this church service, do you know for sure that you'd be in heaven with the Lord? And I couldn't answer yes to that. And I said, I, when he said that, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you haven't received Christ, raise your hand. When I raised my hand, I heard him say, thank you, sir, I see that hand. Then I felt my girlfriend's thing move. Thank you, ma'am, I see the hand. And all of a sudden, all over the place, thank you, sir, thank you, son, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like 20 people gave their heart to the Lord on that Sunday morning. So they, they prayed a prayer with us in there, and they said, see that lady standing over there? There was a door like that, a lady was standing. She was waving her Bible, all smile, face, you know, all happy for us, you know. Come on with us. So they took us in this little kitchen area, and they they prayed they prayed with us together, and they said, "You probably don't you probably don't know what happened to you today." And I I really didn't know what happened to me because I never was taught that. I never was taught that you had to receive, believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth that Jesus was the Lord, and then He would write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Didn't know any of that. It was all brand new to me. So she gave me this little New Testament Bible. And that was one of these ladies, and these guys heard the story before, but she was the crazy lady. Like back in the early 80s, Christians were big on bumper stickers. Well, she had one of them real big station wagons, you know, with the one with the seat that faces, the seat where you could sit and face the back. And uh, she had one of them, and she had bumpers, Christian bumper stickers on the roof, on the hood, on the fenders. That's all that was holding that junker together. So stickers. And she was that lady in the church. She was the crazy lady. But that lady looked me in the eye, and I'll never, I don't know her name, but I'll never forget her face. She looked me in the eye and she said, she said, do us a favor and come back next week. And then she said, no, no, no. She said, do yourself a favor and come back next week. So they instruct us to take that little New Testament and start to read in the book of John. So I was working for my brother-in-law, so I'd go at lunchtime, I wouldn't eat my lunch, I wouldn't eat any lunch. If I ate something, it was quick, maybe drink something. But I started reading that New Testament. And when I started reading that Word of God, after I gave my heart to Jesus, my life was never the same after that. I mean, the lights, the light came on bright. I mean, real bright. So that day, you know, I recognized that I was a sinner, and I recognized the redemption power of God that it has, that it had in my life when I received Christ. So I don't know, you know, what was your, that was my defining moment. I don't know what your defining moment was, but I hope you had one. And if you hadn't had one, then ask God to give you one. Because until you have that defining moment, until you reach that crossroads, that book's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. You can read it all you want. It's just going to be a bunch of words on the page. So, you know, you can be filled up with doctrine. Doctrine's good. I'm, I'm lean. And, and the other thing was, I was never good at school. I wasn't good at math. I wasn't good at reading. I wasn't good at writing. All of a sudden, I'm a Christian now, and they're laying all this studying on me. You got to read this. You got to write, you know, take notes, do this, do that. So I, at 58, I'm starting to get accustomed to that. So the more you do something, the better you get at it. So I'll give you a little tidbit, and this is scientific fact. If you can stop doing something for 30 days, you can beat it. 30 days, one month, I think it's three weeks, you can beat it. Whether it's drugs, whether it's food addiction, whatever, whatever your hang-up is, if you can deny it for 30 days, it'll go away, and you won't crave it anymore. 30 days, that's not a long time, but try it. Try to fast for a day. Try to fast for two days. You really can't even get, really get into the fullness of fasting until after three days. Because after three days, you don't even want to eat anymore. I need to go on a good fast, as you can tell. <laughs> fasting is good for you. It cleans your system out. Now, I know people, for medical reasons, you have to eat. You know, there's doctrinal issues. You know, can you fast TV? I think you could fast a cell phone. I think God would honor that. You put your phone down for a day and said, Lord, I'm not going to fiddle with my phone today just to honor you. I think that's a fast. Now, I had one brother in the church, he about wanted to fight me out in the parking lot over that. Because he was sticking to his doctrine that fasting was food only. And if you believe that, I'm not going to challenge you. You believe whatever you want to believe. Because you and I can get the scripture to say whatever we want to. But what God has done, when Jesus left, he said, I have to go. I have to leave. You know why I have to leave? Because I want to send you the comforter, a helper, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 
So that's how you and I live. You know what the Holy Spirit is that I'm getting ahead of? I don't even have any notes. I'm not even worried about notes anymore. <laughs> I don't need notes. Notes, everything. This is from my heart. This is everything that's in my heart. And I found out in my, in my 38 years, this is a long journey from here to here. Or let me rephrase that. It could be a long journey. It could be a quick trip. But I found out we get a lot of head knowledge, but we ain't got it in here. We ain't got nothing. People don't want to know what you know. They want to know who you are. I, don't, I got people I work with, I don't mention nothing about Jesus to them, but I show them Jesus' love. That's what you do. I'll buy them a sandwich. I'll treat them like a human being. And they, they know something's different. They notice I don't have any profanity in my vocabulary. Sometimes I do. You know what Jesus said? Hey, if you're going to get mad, be mad, but don't sin. Don't sin. Not that a curse. If you curse, you're not going to hell. You know, people that smoke, they're not going to hell. Smell like they've been there, but they're not going to hell, right? <laughs> well, we think as Christian people, oh, that person got tattoos. Oh, that guy rides a motorcycle. Oh, that guy smokes, he's going to hell. Do you hear the vocabulary on that guy? Don't hang around my buddy Alex. He got bad vocabulary. <laughs> Real bad. Woo! I would never talk like him. But it's okay, because he's going to reach out to people that you and I can't get near with a 10-foot pole with a 20-foot extension. Because he can deal with those people who came out of his situation. He was selling drugs. He wound up in jail. So now he can speak to people who are in jail because he's been through that. Amen? So that's kind of my that's kind of my testimony. That's how I came to be where I am today. And if it wasn't for God sending me a beautiful wife, not just beautiful to look at, but she helps. She's my helpmate. She helps me with everything. If something happened to you, I'd be in big trouble. I mean, I can't tie my shoe without her car. That's why I wear a slip on. <laughs> but no, really, she, she's a big blessing to me. And God, God just, we have, four, we have four children together. They're all out of the house now. They're all married. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're all gone. So our one son, our one son, I'll show you how this works with the Holy Spirit. Our one son's a, he's in the Air Force. He's a United States Airman. And he flies on Air Force too. He's not a plot pilot, but he's on the plane. He does some uh, communication. Communication. He's in communications. So we go to DC to vi visit him. Sorry, Alex, you're gonna have to hear the story again. <laughs> this is current. This just happened to me over the summer. So you know, in DC, there's lots of museums. There's lots to see. There's lots of things to do. And uh, so we're up in his little apartment. Everybody lives in a little small. I mean, his whole apartment ain't as big as this corner here. It's about this big. Living room. You know, the living room, the kitchen, the bedroom, it's all in this little space. So we go, we're going to go see the Washington Monument. Remember when they had the earthquake a few years ago? Well, the monument got damaged, it shifted or something, and they put a new elevator in it, and they shorted it up, so we were going to go try to go up in it. So we leave the apartment, we go down on the subway, we go down on the subway platform, and we're sitting down there on the bench. And the, the, uh, the metro lines, everybody travels, excuse me, most people travel by the metro. The metro line was coming. You could hear it coming. You could see the lights in the tunnel. You know, it pulls up in front of the pulls up in front of the platform. You know, not there's no smoke, but you can smell the brakes burning. You know, it's a big event. The thing comes rushing in, then it slows down right in front of you. So I go to I go to get up to get on it. My son grabs my arm. And he says, "This ain't our this ain't our train, Dad." He says, "As a matter of fact, if you get on this train, when you get off of it, you're not gonna like where you're at." My son says that to me, right? So I was doing a study when we got home. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says to renew your mind with the Word of God, renewing of your mind. And, it, and, and I was thinking about that event in the, uh, in the metro station where my son said to me, this ain't our train. Now, I, I found out later on, they go by colors. He was looking at a color on there. What do I know about colors? We're up on the street. We went down the escalator. Boom, we're sitting on this thing. The train pulls up. I figure, this is like, let's go. We're getting on this train, right? I don't even know where we're going. So a good thing I didn't get on that train because it was going where we weren't going. But um, the renewing of your mind, when, when a thought comes into your mind, when it pulls into the platform of your mind, make sure before you get on that, get on that train of thought that it's going to take you where you want to go. See, that's the problem you and I have. It's the way we think. We're supposed to be God-fearing, God-loving, God-anointed, God-blessed people, and we're supposed to think like God. How does God reach the people who are lost and on their way to hell without Christ? He reaches those people through you and I. So if you and I don't think like Christ, we don't think like Jesus, we haven't washed all that cobwebs and all that carnal and all that stinking thinking out of our head, we're not going to be able to operate out there. Let me put it to you this way, another way. 
Let's say I said you and I, we're going to go to outer space, all of us. I got a little rocket ship I built in my garage, and I could load like 80 is in there. We're going to go to outer space. I got any volunteers? Just 80 is. Typically, I got one guy. Well, it's going to be me and you, brother. We're going to outer space. But guess what? If you get in my little rocket ship and we go to outer space together, you and I are going to die. You know why? Because we need the space suit. You see, when we put the space suit on, you know what happens to us? It recreates the atmosphere here on Earth. How's that? Now you and I can get my little ship. We can blast off. We can, I don't know where we're going to go. I hope you've got GPS. But uh, we're going to go where man has never gone before. I'm sure of that. But when we get there, wherever we're going, we're going to be alive because we've got the space suit on. Well, in the reverse order, that's how the Holy Spirit works. You see, when we have the Holy Spirit, the comforter who Jesus sent to us, we can operate in this atmosphere out here. Because we're not thinking like the carnal people that we were born to be by our parents. We're thinking like the re... You see, we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we all have different mothers, but we all have the same Father. We all have the same Father, our Heavenly Father. He's our, that's the same Father we have. We're birthed out of the same spiritual womb. Amen? Amen. That's what makes us related. That's why I feel that family, that's why I feel that family tie in this church because we're tied together by the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. So that happened. What else happened? Oh, so we finally get on. I gotta keep my train of thought going. We finally get on the metro. So there was three seats here. I was sitting next to the window, my wife was in the middle, my son was on the end. There was a bunch of kids over here in the corner. They were all in their own little world, self-absorbed with their phones. They weren't even paying attention to what was going on. So the train leaves, pulls up to a stop, so people get on and off, gets up to another one, people get on and off. Finally, third stop, we're not getting off yet. And this older couple gets on, they get on the train. The lady, so there were seats facing this way. The lady sits right here, and her husband's there, and he's holding on to the pole. You know, they have poles in these things. When the train gets overcrowded, you just hold on to the pole. So I'm sitting there, I'm looking out the window. I'm on vacation now. I don't want to know nothing. I work down in Bloom at Conier. We work night shift. You know, I'm down here in D.C. I want to relax. I want to see some of the, some of the scenery of D.C., right? We're going to go to the Washington Monument. We're going to, we never did get in the monument because we didn't realize you got to be there at 5 in the morning to sign up to get in there. Because it was like one of the first or second days it was open. But, you know, I want to relax. So I'm sitting there looking out the window, and I hear the still small voice. You know that still small voice? Does anybody know that still small voice? Oh, thank, thank God. I'm in the right church now. I hear the still small voice, and the still small, small voice says to me, offer the old man a seat. Guy's standing there, right? Like, yeah. yeah. I, must, I must have ate something for breakfast. Something must be bad, you know. So I just, I just ignore it. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm on vacation. I want to relax. So then, about a minute goes by, and I hear the voice again. The only thing, it's not a gentleman's voice this time. Now it's like, hey, didn't you hear me? I said, offer the old man a seat. Like that. I said, whoa. Yeah, I hear you, Lord. So you don't take, when you go on vacation, you don't leave Jesus home. You pack him up in your suitcase and you take him with you, wherever you go. See, Christianity is not something we do. It's who we are. So, I, so the old man, he wasn't paying attention. He's just riding the train like he does every day. So I tap him on the hand. He looks at me. I said, sir, would you like to see it? Oh, no, no, no. He was had a big shopping bag. He said, no, nah, me and my wife, we do this all the time. Well, she turns to me and looks me in the eye and says, well, thank you, sir. That was very kind. Well, little did she know. No, it wasn't very kind. Because I didn't want to give the old man a seat to begin with. See, that was the Holy Spirit working through me to offer him a seat so that she would know that there's still some good people in the world that care about somebody else who you don't even know. That's supposed to be us, you and me. The blood-washed, blood-bought people of God. Amen? We're supposed to be, we got to pay attention to our environment around us. Because if you don't, your environment is going to climb on you and it's going to eat you alive. It'll eat you alive. So I think the Christian church, we suffer because we're self-absorbed. Self and we're not paying attention. We're not on task. We're not on the mission. Amen? But guess what? God's not mad at us. How am I doing for time? Any good? I just got new glasses and I can't. Oh, is all this money for me up here? Wow. Man, this is a generous church. Okay, I got a little bit of time. I don't want to keep you too long because I can wear you out. 
So I want to just, oh wow, these new glasses are very trip. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read to you out of Romans chapter 5. Um, I'm, going to start in, I'm going to start in verse 1. Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I heard somebody say that the word justified, I heard a preacher say this one time, it's justified, never have sinned. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see my sin and your sin. He sees the blood of Jesus that washed away our sin. But for some reason, the Christian church, you and I, we want to hold on to our sin. Uh, Chris and I fellowship with a, with a bunch of men, and they keep talking about their sin all the time. You know, God's up there going, what sin? What sin? What sin are they talking about? Because all the sins they had, my son died upon the cross, and I throw all that into the seat of forgetfulness. But see, Satan, he's the accuser of the brethren. He wants you to be focused on your shortcoming. He wants you to be focused on your sin, because when you're focused on all that, you're not focused on the mission. The mission is to bring the truth to a lost and dying world when you're all hung up on yourself. You two volunteer a lot, you know. It's a selfless act. You do it when you don't feel like it, huh? Don't, don't rely on your feelings. Listen, we can go down to, down to Unicorn down here and eat something, and that will change the way you feel. Don't rely on your feelings. We walk by faith, the scripture says, and not by sight, amen? amen. So we believe, and, and trust me, faith doesn't make a lot of sense. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That don't make no sense to me. You know, you know one could put a thousand a flight, but two could put 10,000 a flight? Uh, do the math on that. Doesn't work out. So God's, the way God thinks and the way you and I think are two different ways. But guess what? The more we renew our mind with the scripture, the more we read it, the more we listen to people preach, the more we convince washing the renewing of our mind, the better off we're gonna the better off we're gonna be to serve him down here on this planet. Amen. Hey, if you're born again and you've received Christ, when you die, you're going to heaven. And guess what? You didn't you don't catch God by surprise. Your pastor Mike, he didn't catch God by surprise when he died. God knew all about it. God knew about it before he was born. And when I first met Pastor Mike, I don't even remember what, I was trying to think the other day when I first met him. One thing I could tell you about him, when I met him once, and I met him twice, and I met him three times, I knew he was serious about the gospel. I knew he was serious about the plan of God. I knew he was a man who prayed. I knew he was a man who reads the word, because I heard him pray. I know he knows, I know he knows how to talk to God, because I heard the brother pray. You know how I learned how to pray? I went to prayer meetings, and I heard other people pray, how they communicated to God. You know what I'm saying? That's how you learn. You learn from others, the others. That's where we're in this together. You and I are in together. We're not, we weren't made to be an island unto ourselves. Amen? We got each other. We got the body. We're the body. And some of us are the head. And some of us are the ears. And some of us are eyes. And some of us are the feet. And some of us are the hands. And some of us are the wallet. I heard a preacher say one day, if God can get in your wallet, he can lead you anywhere. And I believe that. Because God's not stingy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's not cheap. He sent his only begotten son. Amen? You enjoying this? You getting something out of it? Am I just rambling on? You're not making any noise. Remember I said it's okay to make a little noise? You can shout a little bit. It won't hurt you. Come on. That's why God gave you breath. Hey, you know when people in the Bible, when angels and stuff showed up, you know what they did? They wanted to bow down and worship them. You know what the angels said? Get up. Who do you think I am? I'm just an angel. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. That's who, that's who your worship belongs to. Amen? All right. Let me go to verse 2. So you realize, verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You and I are at peace with God. God's not in a war with you and I anymore, okay? And it's not, by, it's not a feeling of peace, it's a state of being. You understand that? It's not a, we don't feel like we're peaceful. And you're, this scripture is true whether you believe it or not. You remember back, oh, maybe you don't remember, but when I got saved, the bumper stickers were big. They used to have one that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, guess what? God said it, and that settles it whether you believe it or not. See, that's what gives you the power is when you start believing. You read the New Testament. It keeps talking about the believers, the believers, the believers. And I'm not talking about blind faith. God gave you a mind. Go ahead and think about it. Go ahead, he says, meditate on it. Go ahead and meditate on it. Go ahead and think about it. But at the end, you're going to have to be convinced it's his word, and that's it. 
Well, I thank you, Father, that I'm, that I'm prosperous. I thank you, Father, that I live in health. Hey, your checkbook might be empty and you might have a cold. Doesn't matter. You keep confessing what God says you are. Amen? You keep confessing it. You keep standing on the Word. Standing on the Word doesn't mean you throw your Bible on the ground and you stand on it. That ain't going to do nothing for you. <coughs> you know, it's like, it's like a bar of soap. Where's this stuff come from? It's like a bar of soap. I don't even know where it comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's like a bar of soap. When you're out working all day and you're all sweated up, right? You can go home and you can take that bar of soap out of the cabinet. You can take the wrapper off of it. If you never get in that shower and start getting that soap on you, you're going to be stinking. The only way, stinking. The only way that bar of soap works is when you apply it. Amen? When you apply the soap with the water and you make the suds and you get all lathered up and you rinse down, you're clean. Amen? Because you applied the soap. Well, the Word of God is very similar to applying the soap. Amen? If you don't apply that Word to your life, it ain't going to work. I know people that are, that are doctrinally, they're all straight. But guess what? They're not sure about heaven. They're not sure about healing. They're not sure about this. They're not sure. Whatsoever, however a man thinks, so he is. you got to start thinking like God thinks. That sounds big, don't it? i got to think like God thinks. Well, the scripture tells me that you and I are created in His image. We're created in His image and His likeness. Amen? God's, God talks about He's got ears. God has eyes. He has a back. Well, we know God's a spirit. God's a spirit. He's not like Casper. You know, what is a white sheet or something. That's God. No. God's a spirit. He works through His body of Christ. That's us. We're his body part. That's why Jesus had to come in the flesh. So he could be tempted and tested as you and I are, but he was without sin. Don't focus on your sin so much. Your sin, your sin was dealt with upon the cross. You know, you know Jesus' last words, right? It is finished. It's a finished work. You can't add nothing to it or take anything away from it. Oh, we can take part in what he's doing. That's all we do. That's all the church does. We take part in whatever God's already doing on the earth. Amen? We get to choose whether we're going to take part in it or not. He's not going to force you or make you. Because if you don't budge, and he's done this to me, he'll go right around you. Like we do in Jersey. Right around you. <laughs> and he'll get somebody else to go deliver that message. But guess what? You have a destiny. Every person in here, I don't care if you're 15 years old, 14, 12, or you're 75, you still have a destiny. destiny. You have a destination. And God's going to use you to reach people that he can never use me. You have certain things, certain people that God's going to have you on task and you're the only one, like my yo buddy here. When he meets them prisoners, he speaks their language. He speaks their language. He can break through to them. Amen? Right, appreciate the time this morning. I'm going to wrap it up here. I, I have 11 scriptures here. I'll, we'll be here till Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> I have 11 scriptures. Listen to this, verse 2. Through whom we yes. also have access by faith into the grace which we now stand. We stand in grace. You know what grace is? You ever laid on a payment bill? They give you a three or four days grace period? It means they don't penalize you. But we stand in, now we now stand in God's grace. God's not penalizing you and I anymore. He's done with that. He's done with punishing us. Amen? Because all the punishment that he had was laid out on the, on the back of Jesus and on the cross of Jesus. He took it all for us. Well, you're not shouting me down. That's good news. That's the gospel. Amen. Folks. He took it all for us. Amen. God gave you a voice box. Use it. Hmm. All right. Wow. We have a mediator between God and man. That's Jesus Christ. You ever, you ever have something going on in your life and say, where's the Lord? Well, he's right where he's always been since he left. He's at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. That's where Jesus is. And he also lives in the heart of the believer through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's good news, folks. You know, you know what good news to somebody who's poor is? You don't have to be poor anymore. You know what good news to somebody who's sick is? You don't have to be sick anymore. Oh, yeah, you might be experiencing the physical uh, symptoms of being on this side of the cross where you're going to be sick. But if you stand on God's word and proclaim his promises, things will change. You know what the scripture says? He who endures till the end will receive the prize. We gotta be, we, this, is not a, this is not a short sprint. This is an endurance race, amen? We gotta run a race with that prize in mind. Listen, your fire insurance, if you said yes to Christ, your fire insurance is paid. 
That which is seen, the scripture says, is temporal. But that which is unseen is eternal. You know who created hell? God did. That which is unseen, that which is seen is temporal, but that which is unseen. It said God created everything, right? By the word of his power. He created hell. He didn't create hell for you and I. He created hell for Lucifer and all his angels. Anybody familiar with the pastor Reinhard Bonnke? He just died about two weeks ago. Nobody's familiar with him? He was a big evangelist over in, over in uh, Africa. I mean, they had like 2.5 million people come to their crusades after, after he was over there for 25 years. But his, his mission statement was, I want to plunder hell and populate heaven. I want to get all those people out of their bondage of hell and get them to the cross and have them receive Christ so that heaven can be a populated place. Amen? Amen. So we got to be careful when we read the scripture and we got to have some knowledge and some schooling. The scripture says to study to show thyself approved. We got to be home doing some study. We can't rely on an evangelist like me or a pastor or whoever. You can't rely on them. You got to do it for yourself. You got to plug in. Don't worry about whatever. I worried about so long. I used to say, man, my pastor Rick Galena, I used to say, man, I wish I could ar 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 articulate the word like he does. Well, guess what? That's him and I'm me. You have to be who God created you to be. You got to be, as they say, comfortable in your own skin. So I'm better at just talking to you as a friend and telling you what my experiences were. That's part of my gift. And hopefully, I'm trying to take you. See, let's just say the kingdom of God has 10 levels and you're on level two. Well, I'm trying to get you in your head to say, yeah, I can get to level three. But don't get too comfortable on level three. You know why? Because God wants you to move to level four. Then when you're at level four, he don't want you to stay there. There's no, when you get to the next level, there's no seats there. There's no place to sit down. Because God keeps calling us to a higher level, higher standard. When you get this behind you, then he moves you to the next thing. Amen? Amen. Listen, living a holy life, I went and did a little research on the free Methodist. You know, you all are part of the holiness movement. Well, you know what the word holy means? It means that your life is set apart. That you're set apart. That's what holy means. So you and I need to live a life that's set apart. So when all my buddies from work are going to the go-go bar, guess who ain't going? Brother Joe. I'm not going. You know why I'm not going? Because I love Jesus more than I love that. More than I love the things of this world. Amen? Jesus said, be in the world, but not of it. Mm -hmm. That's what we got to do in the Christian church. We got to get to that. When we're in this world, we're not of it. Instead of being part of the problem, you and I are part of the answer. Amen? Oh, you're going to have a bad day. You're going to have a bad day. You're not going to feel like it. You're not going to offer the old man a seat. You know, that, that little test? I don't know about you. I love the testimony. I love to give testimony, but I can't stand that test. I don't like the test. <laughs> and you know when I'm in the test? You ever take a test in school? What's the teacher doing? She's sitting over there at the desk, silent. She don't say a word during that test. Amen? What do you think God's doing up there? You're in the test. He ain't saying a word. Look, where's God? Well, the scripture says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. That's where he is. He didn't move. If anybody moves away from God, it's you. I was telling them at my church, I preached a couple weeks ago, I said, when, when the face, Spirit of God and the things of God turned off for me, it's because I walked away and I turned it off. Not because he did. He never moved. He saved me. He sanctified me. He filled me with the Spirit. And that's where I'm standing right now is where I stand right now in that blessing. Amen? So I hope you're getting something out of this. I hope, you feel, I hope you're picking up what I'm laying down. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? That's like kind of a modern term kids say. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Yeah, bro. Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah, bro. You know. Hey, yeah, bro. I like to ride Harley. I got a Harley. I love getting in the wind. I like riding motorcycle. I like shooting, ski. I like doing all this manly stuff. Hey, just because you're serving God, you don't have to give your life up. Hey, you like, you like bass fishing, guys? Do all the bass fishing you want. But don't forget God when you're out there in his creation fishing for the bass. Right, Bobby? Yes, sir. These two are good fishermen, dude. <laughs> Husband and wife, they'll clean the whole pond down. <laughs> get there before him. So do what you know. Our senior pat or our founding pastor of New Covenant, he always used to say, God's created life for living. So live your life, but don't exclude God. You know, he allows us to go through problems and situations. Listen, if you can do this on your own, if you can do all this on your own and have a have a righteous life before God, Jesus went to the cross for nothing. He died and bled for nothing. God was so strategic. You know, and all this stuff. Sorry I didn't give you a Christmas message today, but guess what? You see that Christmas tree over there? That's got nothing to do with Christmas. Because right. Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Christ. Ain't no, got nothing to do with no tree. That was, that was a people called the Druids. 
they were tree worshippers, mm -hmm. and they used to cut them down and bring them in the house. So we took a pagan thing, the Christian church, yeah. we brought it right in, set it on the altar. Bang. And if you have a Christmas tree, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay to... It's okay that you guys have a Christmas tree. I'm not putting a Christmas tree down. I'm just trying to say that to let you know how we get things out of perspective. Christmas, Christmas tree got nothing to do with the birth of Christ. Nope. Amen? Amen. All right. It's okay to have a Christmas tree. Enjoy your Christmas tree. Enjoy the Christmas season. Enjoy your family. You know, if something happens to my car, I could get a new car. If I lose my wallet, I could get new credentials. Whatever little money I got in there, I could always get more money. But one thing I can't get back anymore. One thing that you and I have, you and I have that God gave us is very precious, and that's our time. Once you, once you spend that time, you can't get it back. So my advice, my closing statements this morning, my advice to you is take care of your time and use it preciously. And when I say preciously, I mean use it for the kingdom, because you're never going to get any more time back. You see this, see this watch I'm wearing? Alex and I are watch guys. We've got a whole bunch of watches. we always got a different watch on. We like watches. It's okay. But this watch is not my idol. But guess what? I bought this watch, and I paid my money for it. And I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to make sure somebody don't steal it on me. I'm going to wipe it off and keep it nice and shiny. And guess what? I take care of my stuff, and you're going to take care of your stuff, right? That you paid for it? Well, guess what God does? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him will not perish. God's going to take care of us that Jesus paid for. Amen? The same way you and I take care of our stuff, he's going to take care of us. So I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter because there's only one answer to every problem you've got. You know what that answer is? The name of Jesus. So whatever situation you've got, whether it's financial, whether it's a problem with your brother, whether it's a family matter, whether you lost your job, whatever it is, invoke that name of Jesus over it and stand in faith believing that God's going to take care of it. And it's not going to be in your timing. See, we're in such a push-button microwave society. You know, we pray in the morning and we expect by the end of the day that God's going to answer our prayer. It's all work like that. We're not, on, he's not on our time. We're on his time. The 24 hours he gives us each and every day, he gave that, that time to us. So when you jump out of bed in the morning, give praise to the Lord. Amen? Well, I appreciate your time this morning. Chris, like I said, if they don't like me, it's on you, brother. Mm -hmm. You invited me. I really appreciate your time. You guys have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for having me and my friends and my wife this morning. And uh, see you here, there, or in the air, I guess. <laughs> Bye. Amen. 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 Thank you.